If you're in the market for weapons of war, it doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> The Land Forces Expo in Adelaide draws the top political and army brass. You know Rick Verdi? No, yeah. I am. You're so yeah. 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 Major military hardware manufacturers are here to show off their wares. With your left trigger finger, go ahead and click that and lock on the target. We'll get some crosshairs. There's a virtual anti-tank missile. And then fire with your right trigger. Okay, let's see if you hit it. Good God. All right. Look at that. It. Look at that. And body armor for the modern warrior. Because yeah. this is so intimidating. Oh, it's awesome. Um, you also have to be careful that you don't walk into somewhere and it kicks off. And in prime position is Australia's largest privately owned gun supplier, a company called Naya. Its owner, Robert Nyer, is here doing business. Nyer's company holds Australian defence contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars and sells guns and ammunition used by hunters, shooters and the police. Robert Nyer is also a founding director of the Gun Lobby Group, the Shooting Industry Foundation of Australia, known as CIFA. Excuse me, Mr Nyer. Hi, yes. Sean Nichols is my name. Yeah. I'm from the Four Corners program with oh, ABC right. Television. Yeah, yeah, How Robert are you? Nye, yeah, going yeah. Well. Now, you... Robert Nyer is prominent in defence circles, but today prefers to keep a lower profile. Would, would you have a chat with us today? Not really, no. I mean, I'm, I'm here trying to do defence work, uh, focusing on what we can do for the Australian warfighter, creating technologies yeah. um, and export opportunities. But is, is there any particular reason that you wouldn't talk about CIFA to us? I mean, you know, it's something that you're quite open about as a director and there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. We just want to ask you what the it's purpose the, is and why you're involved. Everything we're doing is on the website, public forum, and I suspect that you've got a different agenda and you want to say strange things. Well, you won't find out until I ask you the question. That's so right. if That's you've okay. got five minutes, no, that'd be great. I don't. So I'm in the middle of a meeting. We're trying to give soldiers something to, uh, to, to help them out with. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks. For, thanks for your time. Thanks. Appreciate it. The Shooting Industry Foundation was launched in late 2014 by five of Australia's biggest firearms wholesalers, including Naya and the Australian subsidiaries of global gun makers Winchester and Beretta. These companies have funded CIFA with more than $1.2 million. This represents the re-emergence of the very well bankrolled industrial gun lobby, which is there not so much to go shooting, but to make a profit. And that's exactly the same as it is in other countries. You've got an industry which is prepared to leap in, and they've got a lot of money. This is the, this is the gun industry lobby redux. They, they've come, they're back, and they're ready to spend. There is a muscling up by those making money out of a trade of guns into this country. And we need to watch that very closely, lest it lead Australia and the state and territory parliaments, uh, legislatures and at the federal level down the wrong path. Hi, I'm Laura Patterson and welcome to CIFA News. It is CIFA's objective to enter a new era of consultation with Australian states and territories to ensure the development of quality policy. CIFA's public face is Victorian gun shop owner, Laura Patterson. Why was CIFA set up? There was no industry body, no peak body that represented the interests of firearms businesses in this country. Uh, and so the five directors got together and negotiated over a period of time to establish the Shooting Industry Foundation of Australia uh, so that they could work together to represent or to have a, a body that represented their interests. Given that CIFA is backed and conceived by uh, large firearms wholesalers, doesn't it follow that CIFA's overwhelming objective is to sell more guns? 
No, I don't think that is the case. I think CIFA's overwhelming objective is to uphold the standards of Australian safety, security and sovereignty. Our objectives are around advocacy, they're about research, they're about safety promotion and they're about education. CIFA does more than just talk to politicians. At the 2016 federal election, it gave more than $60,000 to the Liberals, Liberal Nationals and Shooters, Fishers and Farmers. That year, it sponsored a fundraiser for pro-gun national senator Bridget McKenzie. It also organises political networking events. We sponsored our successful politician shoot with the National Press Club and the Parliamentary Friends of Shooting in Canberra just prior to Christmas. OK. Bridget McKenzie was there. Yay! So was Agriculture Minister David Littleproud. That's the right idea. Well, here we are, hey? Mary River Station. That's my money. Nice, isn't it? Yeah, let me know if you see one. Apart from being an avid hunter, CIFA director Robert Nyer is also a generous political donor. The hide here is over an inch thick. At last year's Queensland election, a company he controls gave $150,000 to Catter's Australian Party. There's too many buffalo. Right, now we're going to go have a look at a croc. Robert Nyer is the party leader Bob Catter's son-in-law. Your son-in-law is in the business of selling more firearms. Is your party happy to be helping him do that? Absolutely. I want more firearms sold because I want more firearms, you know. I want more people involved in protecting our country. Bob Catter's son, Robbie, is the party's leader in the Queensland Parliament. Does Mr Nye have any policy input into your party's firearms policies? Oh, no, not really, no. We would, we not would really probably... Not really or no? Oh, I'd say a no to that because um, there's, we've got all sorts of avenues to... Um, and, and usually to avoid questions like this in the media, we'd, we'd deliberately go to, um, to, you know, other groups out there that uh, represent the industry. And, but presumably you've discussed the firearms issue with... Mr. Nyer. Oh, you know, he's my brother-in-law and we're, we're close, so, you know, clearly we'd... Um, but, you know, I don't, um, I don't have veto or, or, or the say on everything in the party. I have, I'm a voice in it, but um, there's a lot of other people involved than me, so... What's your view, broadly, of Australia's gun laws? Um, they are restrictive to a point where you have a de facto ban. I think it is very hard for anyone to meet the requirements of gun laws in Australia. So you have what I would consider effectively a ban on the use of firearms in this country. Um, <clears throat> if not the most restrictive laws on earth, outside of the totalitarian regimes, I would say definitely the most restrictive laws on earth. Catter's Australian party is fiercely pro-gun. It wants to scrap limits on ammunition sales and to give farmers the right to use handguns. I want my nation able to protect itself. We're a tiny little country, 25 million people, and a lot of those people would owe allegiance to other countries that may well be our enemies in any future confrontation. So, I mean, not only have you got a threat from outside, but increasingly, you've got a threat from inside, and it may not just be a threat. I mean, they may have a majority in this country within the next 25 years, if you want to extrapolate the number of people coming in. Um, so you've got a threat from within as well as a threat from without. It promises to be an election like no other. We could be in for another cliffhanger. CIFA's first big political hit out was at last year's Queensland election. Labor was just clinging on to government and One Nation and Catter's Australian party had a real chance of seizing the balance of power. CIFA did its best to make that happen. What we were aiming for was a good quality crossbench and we were aiming for a, a government which couldn't be formed by majority. So when you say you hoped to achieve minority government, 
and create an environment for better discussion about issues. Mm -hmm. What were those issues? Well, one of the issues for us was around um, the recategorisation of firearms in Queensland. One of the firearms CIFA wanted recategorised was the controversial Adler lever action shotgun to make it more freely available. Traditional lever action shotgun. Robert Nyer imports this gun into Australia. Every cycle of the gun uh, that you do like that. We're glad to have support of, um, you know, sporting shooters, um, uh, Rob Nye, anyone else that supports the Do you industry. understand the perception that your brother-in-law wants to sell more firearms to make lots of money? Your party is an advocate for oh, well, loosening I mean, of firearms he, laws? He does, I mean, what, is it, what does that look like? I can't separate the two issues. He does what he does. He's a business and, and I'm a politician and, and, and whether he didn't exist as a business or not, I'd still be pushing the same issues because I've got relationships with sporting shooters and others and this is an issue I grew up with. Three weeks before polling day, a major campaign was launched, backing the minor parties. The LNP and Labor have failed on powering our state. Flick them. Labor and the LNP are all problems and no solutions. Flick them. LNP and Labor don't care about regional communities. Flick them. Put the majors last! This campaign came out of nowhere. Like we had um, no warning that it was coming, but Candidates started seeing these ads appearing in Facebook feeds. We started billboards popping up. In Queensland, the ALP and LNP have sold off Queensland assets. Flickham focused on high electricity prices and the lack of services in the bush. Regional Queensland has been forgotten by the ALP and the LNP. Families are struggling as it is. I just got a, like, $1,100 power bill. Flickham, put the majors last. It was presented as a grassroots movement, angry at Labor and the Liberal National Party. Don't you wish they'd both stop? Flick them and put the ALP and LNP last this election. Obviously the campaign was very much to tap into the electorates, especially voters in regional Queensland, into the anti-politician uh, sentiment that's been bubbling along in Queensland and other parts of Australia now for years, in fact a couple of decades. Um, so obviously it was targeting uh, the disgruntled, the disenfranchised, um, the disillusioned voter who might like, be might, most likely to vote for One Nation or Cata or um, and a conservative independent. And really the campaign was urging voters to stick one up the major parties. It became clear that it was a protest campaign um, being put together by advocates for gun law reform here in Queensland. And that was masked, was it? Yeah, like, um, the campaign that they were running had nothing to do with guns. Like, the, the idea, I think, was to uh, inspire people to move their vote to protest vote with minor parties in the hope that that hold the balance of power after the election. And why would that be of benefit to them? Well, I mean, the choice of the election was, um, you know, Premier Palaszczuk or a um, Conservative government beholden to minor parties, and I think um, those minor parties uh, in Queensland often have support for uh, liberalisation of gun laws, which would have seen the gun lobby put in a really powerful position here in Queensland. CIFA ploughed $220,000 into the half million dollar campaign. Why wasn't there any branding, any CIFA branding on any aspect of the Flickham campaign? Because the Flickham campaign was a communications campaign based in Queensland, based on the ideas and views of Queenslanders, and it wasn't about CIFA. It was about getting a better representative government for the people of Queensland. It looks like you were trying to hide your involvement. We weren't trying to hide our involvement. Well, I, I saw the big billboards and I saw the uh, advertisements on television and I thought they were excellent. I mean, no one consulted me about them, I just saw them up there and I thought that they were excellent. I mean, the major parties, I mean, you just walk the streets anywhere and they are just hated. For one high-profile politician, the election campaign became intensely personal. The state's small business minister became a target after she complained about a gun shop billboard in her electorate. This billboard had an image on it of um, a woman dressed in some Santa gear, if you like, 
uh, and on the billboard it said, um, Santa knows what you really want for Christmas. And it was a picture of this woman um, holding a gun. My first reaction to it was one of horror. This is really diminishing the value, uh, the importance of, uh, the responsibility of uh, gun ownership. So many of them. Leanne Enoch launched a Facebook petition to have the ad removed. She said it didn't reflect her community's desire to be gun free. The response was savage. I was receiving threats of sexual uh, violence, of physical violence. I had threats to my life. Um, and that spilled over uh, into some of the, uh, that spilled over towards some of the people that were actually making positive comments about bringing the billboard down as well. More than 3,000 comments flooded in from Australia and overseas. Among them, let someone break into your house and rape and kill you. Someone shoot this bitch and remember that while being raped. There were moments where I really thought, am I in danger here? I mean, these are people who were advocating the watering down of gun laws. These were people that have access to guns. Sifa condemned the petition, accusing her of wanting to ban all guns. How did it feel to be targeted like that uh, by, by a big, powerful, firearms lobby when it dawned on you that it just wasn't, you know, mm. a bunch of maybe foul-mouthed, irresponsible <laughs> people on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, there is a bit of a difference between uh, being the, um, the subject of a, a group of trolls, if you like, I think we all understand uh, how that works, uh, to then being uh, the subject of a campaign uh, that had some pretty powerful, uh, wealthy individuals and wealthy associations attached to it. Does CIFA bear any responsibility for what happened to Leanne Enoch? It upsets me personally, and I'm sure uh, it is... Uh, that behaviour is absolutely something that the Shooting Industry Foundation of Australia would condemn. We do not condone in any way any activity of that variety in any form. On election day, the Liberal National Party vote dropped 7% and Labor scraped home by just two seats. Qatar's Australian party and One Nation each picked up a new seat. CIFA had failed to get the minority government it wanted, but boasted it caused the lowest major party vote in Queensland's history. It did actually fall below 70% of the primary vote, and that's a remarkable historical event for Queensland, uh, even for a state that's had One Nation for more than 20 years. But it's probably a bit rich for Flickham to take sole responsibility, but there's no doubt it would have contributed to that. There are about three million firearms legally registered in Australia. On this Saturday morning, more than a hundred licensed shooters are gathered at Malabar in East Sydney. The New South Wales Rifle Association's annual open competition attracts shooters from across the country. This is the type of event the gun industry is proud to promote. It's a different sport and you also like learn a new thing every day or every week we come out here. As well as the community around it, you like meet new, heaps of different and new people. And yeah, I just really enjoy it. At the moment we've got families out here where they're both Australian representatives. Um, competing at international international levels, um, fathers, sons, um, mothers, and their, their their sons, mothers, and their daughters shooting side by side out here, um, competing against each other in uh, in a friendly competition, or maybe not so friendly sometimes. Legitimate firearm owners in Australia are probably one of the uh, last groups that are happily discriminated against uh, by all levels of government and demonised by politicians when election times come around. Put these on the other side. Yeah, if you can put them right in the front, that'd be great, Sean. No worries. Cattle farmer Graham Park is the national president of the Shooters Union of Australia. 
a lobby group that claims 10,000 members in Queensland alone. The gun control thing in Australia is a never-ending uh, story because the people on one side of the argument keep wanting to make it stricter and stricter and stricter and the reality for anyone who owns firearms is they have seen the regulations and the policies change incrementally all over that time to make it far more difficult to own firearms, especially for those who use them occupationally. The Shooters Union is a fee-paying affiliate of one of the most powerful lobby groups in America, the National Rifle Association. I urge every law-abiding American to take measures to defend yourself, arm yourself, get the proper training, demand your national right to carry, and use it. Your safety is in your hands. And thank God we have the Second Amendment. By publicly acknowledging and celebrating your affiliation with the National Rifle Association, aren't you aligning yourselves with an organisation which is widely regarded as having very extreme views on firearm ownership? Their views on firearm ownership are related to the United States, which is a radically different cultural situation to here and we don't advocate that for here and they don't advocate ours for there. So whilst they are a very, probably one of the world's most successful grassroots lobby groups, whether you like them or dislike them, um, we can maybe learn some things from them on that. Graham Park believes shooters are changing Australian politics. They are supportive of independents or minor parties who are more supportive of their interests and their needs. I think it's partially why you're seeing some votes move away from the, from the major parties and to some of the, the, the smaller parties, like the Catter Party in Queensland is, is probably a good example. Um, One Nation in, in different parts of the country, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, uh, uh, you know, in, in especially in New South Wales and, and other states, um, Victoria having some success. New South Wales is the power base of the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In Tumut, in the state south, party candidate. chief Robert Borsak's keeping watch over his candidate in the Wagga Wagga by-election. Please welcome Seb McDonough. Seb McDonough's making his pitch at the final voters' forum. I know many of the frustrations which people are experiencing through the lack of services that smaller towns receive. He never once mentions gun rights. How'd your boy go, Robert? Well, I think he came across as likeable. Uh, certainly the mo not the most polished out of the lot, but I think basically across all the issues that were put forward. So there was absolutely no mention of firearms in any no, way, shape or form here. What, what do you make of that? Look, I make, I make of that what, uh, what... Well, what I make of that is that it's basically a city preoccupation. Uh, it's something that uh, the usual suspects get out and talk about uh, and beat up to the point of being ridiculous. It's, it's less than a tenth-rate issue in the bush. Here in the bush, the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party is broadening its appeal building up its political muscle for the New South Wales Parliament, where it's been cutting deals for 20 years. We're going to give you going this one. What's this one? He's got a Thanks, shoot. Oh, oh come on. No, 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 no. We're down to now. We're down to Nerf Gun. It's Nerf Wars. You all right? This is on us. No guns in this campaign. No guns in this campaign. This is a campaign. This is a This is a gun. It's a kid's one. It's from Kmart. Shoot the Nerf Gun. Go on. You don't have to pull it off. All right, so what you do is you pull that back, arm out straight, and I'm right on Superman's S. You know, That's I'm not ready to go. My glasses, <laughs> hey, headshot. <laughs> this one's our Aussie. Robert Borsak is a key figure in the strategy to recast the party's image. If we are going to be successful as a movement, um, eventually we need to widen our base. And we think that we've got an affinity as a party with the bush. 
And we want to work on that. We want to make a better deal out of that as far as the people, for the people in the bush. Linking the shooters and the fishers and the farmers was a really clever idea and it got them a long way and it's kept them in power. They've got the balance of power quite often, which is scary when you think about what a tiny minority they are. In New South Wales, ready access to guns has led to fatal consequences and moves to tighten firearms laws have been resisted. Well, I never knew it was so easy to get a firearm licence. I, I thought that they brought in laws to make it more and more difficult. And, you know, it was... It, after finding out um, what happened in my matter, it, it's, it's quite surprising how easy it is for someone to get a firearm. Ten years ago at Eastwood in northwest Sydney, a massacre was narrowly averted. One lunchtime in March 2008, police responded to reports of a man acting strangely in the mall. Sergeant Peter Stenz and his partner followed him into this laneway. Well, at this point here, I, I started, I thought, we've got to stop this guy. And I started running and I sort of yelled, yelled out to him and then he started running as well. As I started running to him, I saw him reach behind his back and he pulled out a gun. I was just, had my gun out, looking down the barrel of my gun, slowly walking around here. At this point here, I've seen him with his gun drawn, pointed at me. At this point here, everything went into slow motion. I just, yeah, I just, it's just bringing back shocking memories now. <laughs> but, yeah, he started shooting at me, I've then, Returned fire, fired quick free bullets, quickly pulled out of the way. I've heard him continue to fire at me. I've tripped over this here, I think. And I've landed on the ground. I've still got my firearm pointed in that direction and I've lost sight of him. Uh, and Glenn was just over there on that corner there, still with his firearm pulled. I've got up. Glenn's called out, stop police or, you know, drop the gun. I've heard another shot, and then Glenn said he shot himself in the head. The 22-year-old gunman had more than 120 rounds of ammunition with him. He was armed to cause death and harm or have a war, I don't know. I don't know. No one knows. You can only speculate exactly what his intentions were. The gunman was a member of St Mary's Pistol Club in Sydney's West, run by a lobby group, the Sporting Shooters Association. His firearms licence had expired three months before the shooting, but illegally, he'd kept the weapon at home. An inquest heard he was probably mentally ill. The deputy coroner in the inquest made a key recommendation that anybody applying or reapplying for a firearms licence in New South Wales should be subject to a mental health check. What do you think about that idea? Yes, yes. If if they, you know, if the government did something and uh, you know maybe introduced a new law, and it's this, it wasn't anything unrealistic. It's something that could have been easily put in place. It, may, it would have made things harder for some people, but, you know, ultimately, you know, it would have saved lives. I don't think a, a GP is qualified to uh, mentally assess me, for example, or you. Um, for a start, the, uh, the AMA is always seen to be anti-gun. Doesn't matter what you say or do, they'll always mitigate against anything in relation to that. Um, so I don't, I don't think that... Uh, doctors and the art of so-called psychology or psychiatry is well enough to advance to be able to get around a, a fair assessment of anyone in relation to a firearms licence. The mental health check recommendation was never adopted. The New South Wales Police told Four Corners it was not feasible. And four months after the Eastwood shootout, firearms laws in New South Wales were weakened 
when the Labor government supported a change proposed by the Shooters' Party. Before 2008, the firearms laws required people to be licensed before they could shoot a firearm. In 2008, they amended the law to allow people to access a club and shoot even though they were unlicensed. We wanted to look to get people who were interested in going shooting an opportunity to turn up at a range and have a shot. And uh, I, think, I think history has shown us that with a couple of uh, exceptions in the last 10 years that uh, uh, that's largely worked properly uh, and it's worked well. The law change had devastating consequences for Michelle Fernando's family. Well, my father was shot and killed with a pistol from the Sydney Pistol Club. And the person who shot him was one of my sisters. She was very mentally ill at the time. And she was accessing the club through the loophole in the law. Had she gone through a proper licensing process, then it seems highly likely to me that a background check would have raised concerns about her mental health. How long have you been lobbying politicians on this issue? I've been lobbying governments from both sides for about eight years. I've had mixed responses and uh, the law remains as it is. I certainly haven't been able to achieve the closing of that loophole. Why do you think that is? I think because the gun lobby is incredibly powerful. It wields a, a level of power that is disproportionate to the interests, the minority interests that it represents. As tragic as that particular example is, we don't think that, think that one or two or maybe three in the last 10, year, 10 years of failures should actually th mitigate against the creation of maybe another 20, 30, 40, 50,000 licences of perfectly ordinary people who just want to participate in the sport of shooting. Tonight, two children shot dead and a third person injured in northwest Sydney. In July this year, another member of the St Mary's Pistol Club, retired financial advisor John Edwards, shot dead two of his children before killing himself. He used legally acquired handguns to murder 15-year-old Jack and Jennifer, who was 13, in their West Pennant Hills home. How many people have to die for a small group of people to pursue a sport in such a casual way. I'm not even asking that nobody be allowed to shoot for fun anymore. That's not what I'm asking for. I'm just asking that access to firearms not be so casual. One of the most audacious attempts by the gun lobby to change firearms laws happened in the least expected place, Tasmania. It was here at Port Arthur in April 1996 where a gunman killed 35 people. Hobart GP Phil Pullinger was then 16 years old. He's now president of the group Medics for Gun Control. It's one of those events, I think particularly so for Tasmanians, where um, where you were and what you were doing when you heard just absolutely sticks in your memory. So I can remember being at home with Mum uh, and the story came through on the radio about someone had gone crazy at Port Arthur and a couple of people had been killed. And then as the afternoon rolled on, that number just kept going up and up and up. The federal government's response was the National Firearms Agreement it struck with the states and territories to amend their gun laws. We, as a parliament of the land in 1996, at that time, together 
we made a difference. John Howard's reforms took the semi-automatics and the automatics out of the suburbs, towns, and yes, it was a turning point and it made a difference. The states and territories agreed to ban wide access to semi-automatic rifles and shotguns, which were bought back and destroyed. It was a huge ask on law-abiding citizens, but it was an ask worth obtaining and delivering on because it has made a huge difference. Since those laws were brought in, there has been a collective sense that the issue was fixed, that in Australia we didn't have to worry about mass shootings, we didn't have to worry about um, seeing the sort of violence that we see um, every week in the United States, that we'd fix the issue um, and uh, we could get on with our lives. Last year, a review found the states and territories are failing to uphold this agreement. Under 18 year olds can still get gun licences. And some states have dumped a 28 day cooling off period for second and subsequent firearms. The review's author was Professor Philip Alpers. There are three pillars to gun control. One is licensing, the next is registration, and then of course it, that it's a conditional privilege, not a right to own a firearm. Now all of those three are still intact in the National Firearms Agreement. What's happened is that there's been a lot of whittling away around the edges, trying to water down the effect of the law, to do anything possible to reduce the effect of the law for the convenience of shooters and the benefit of the arms industry. And that's been going on for 20 years now, and there's been some success. Earlier this year, the Tasmanian government was facing a tight election. It needed all the help it could get and turned to the gun lobby to help write its new firearms policy. The government uh, was trying to walk a line between giving in to the gun lobby but not putting the community offside, and the end result of that uh, was that this policy uh, was created in secrecy, in consultation with the shooting groups. One of those consulted was the lobby group CIFA. In my view, a number of firearm lobby groups just wrote a wish list uh, and said to the um, uh, police minister, this is what we want. Um, if you want our support, this is what you're going to have to deliver to us. In a letter to shooting groups, the police minister proposed easier access to semi-automatic rifles and shotguns for sporting shooters, to double the licence period to 10 years for some firearms and allow the use of silencers. My first thought was that it was um, a forgery <clears throat> because um, the idea of a Tasmanian Liberal government um, wanting to reintroduce um, semi-automatic, uh, rapid-fire guns into the hands of the community um, after they had been taken out of the hands of the community um, was astonishing. Stakeholders had been notified back in February, 9th, I think 9th of February of this year, of, of some changes, but the stakeholders did not include, in my opinion, probably the most important stakeholder in this whole thing, that was the public the public had no knowledge of what was going on. News of this secret deal leaked on the eve of the election. The government was accused of breaching the National Firearms Agreement. We will not compromise the National Firearms Agreement. We will not in any way do anything to endanger Tasmanians or to uh, do anything but better support Tasmanian farmers and recreational shooters. In terms of a national precedent, if Tasmania, the place where Port Arthur happened, uh, of all places, if Tasmania started under, unwinding um, the national laws and acting at odds with the national laws, then the national laws would be in deep, deep trouble. <laughs> the public outcry forced the government to dump the policy after the election. The deals that are done behind the scenes with politicians 
um, are not in the community's interests. They are solely in the interest of the gun um, importers and distributors in Australia. The gun debate is very much about money and influence and power. Groups like yours are accused by gun control groups of chipping away at firearms laws incrementally so that nobody's really noticing that gradually there are going to be significant changes to Australia's firearms laws. Shooting Industry Foundation of Australia has never advocated for the chipping down or otherwise dilution of the National Firearms Agreement. The Firearms Agreement needs critical review in order that it continues to uphold Australian standards of safety, security and sovereignty. CIFA is now eyeing off elections in Victoria next month, New South Wales in March, and the upcoming federal poll. The divisive question of gun laws is again confronting Australia. We're looking to enter a new era of engagement. Uh, we want it to be open. We want people to understand who we are and why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we want governments to be held accountable for the decisions they make. It is uh, just uh, a determination by some very smart operators to uh, keep uh, attacking uh, the harmonised gun laws, gun safety laws of this country. Uh, it's about politics uh, on the margins and it's dangerous. <laughs>